Good afternoon. Um, our purpose is quite modest. Today we're going to change the world. And so we, we thank you for joining us today to be a part of that. Uh, the Brock Prize Symposium is a symposium that's hosted between our three partner institutions, University of Oklahoma, University of Tulsa, and Oklahoma State University. It's Oklahoma State University's time to host this year, and, uh, and we opted to host it here in, in, uh, at OSU Tulsa. So uh, I would like Dr. Pam Fry to come give a, an official OSU welcome. Uh, Dr. Pam is, uh, Dr. Pam, Dr. I, I call her Dr. Pam. So Dr. Fry is Provost and, uh, and Vice President of Academic Affairs at, o at uh, Oklahoma State University, Tulsa, and a member of our Executive Committee. So Pam. Thank you, Ed. Good afternoon, everyone. We are really thrilled to have you here on our campus this afternoon. As Tulsa's downtown, downtown public comprehensive research university, preparing all levels of educational leaders is an important part of what we do. The Brock Family Community Foundation has been an important partner in many of our educational initiatives, particularly the Brock Fellowship in Educational Leadership, which has helped dozens of local teachers earn their master's degrees in uh, school administration. We're grateful for the foundation's support. Providing professional development opportunities for educators is crucial for the success of Oklahoma schools. That's why OSU Tulsa is so pleased to host this year's Brock Prize Symposium, including our distinguished guest this year's Brock Laureate. I hope you enjoy today's program, and again, welcome to OSU Tulsa. Thanks. Thank you. As I mentioned, uh, Dr. Fry is one of our executive committee members, and others on our executive committee are Dr. Martha Banz, Associate Pro uh, Provost and Dean, Extended Campus, the University of Oklahoma, Dr. R.C. Davis Undiano, Director of World Literature Today at the University of Oklahoma, Provost Janet Levitt, Provost and Executive Vice President of Academic Affairs at the University of Tulsa, and I, I'm also on the executive committee. Before we get started, and I like to read these because uh, these instructions, but they're instructions to me to read to you. So I have a couple of announcements for our live and virtual audience. First, to join the online conversation about the symposium, follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook and comment hashtag Brock Symposium. And second, at the end of the program, we will answer questions from both the live and virtual audience. To submit a question at any time, simply text or email us the following, us following the instructions at the bottom of the screen. For those of you in the live audience, instructions are also printed on the cards you will find on your seat. Your questions will be transmitted electronically to our moderator for the Q&A session, and you may begin questioning your questions at any time. Some of you are new in the audience. You may not be familiar with the Brock Prize. We are here. I sort of said that. Um, I wasn't really kidding when I said we're here to change the world. That's why we exist. We, uh, we look for the best ideas in education, and we look for ideas that make a difference. And a lot of educators are here, and you know the numerous ideas and trends that have come and gone, uh, even if you've been in education a, a short time. I've been in a long time. But what we're looking for are ideas that make a substantial impact on society. We want ideas that make a change. And so before we, be, we begin, and as a segue into our conversation with our laureate today, we, have, we put together a brief summary of what the prize is all about.
And before we introduce our laureate, I wanted to introduce members of his family. And accompanying Jeff uh, this week uh, are his twin sons, Amaru and Tayari. And so, and it, uh, I would like to say that they are, they're six years old, they're twins, and I'd like to say they're very astute learners and patient teachers. And um, from the point, from the time they got off the, the <laughs> from the time they got off the plane, they've been teaching me patiently how to say their names properly. And, um, and so I try my best, is, is this, o did I do okay, Amaru? Okay, good, thanks. I think I need to work on it some more. Also, they're very astute learners. Uh, I sort of introduced myself very quickly um, as Ed Harris, and I introduced myself, Ed Harris, Ed Harris. So they picked that up very quickly, and that's one word to them. And so they say, hey, Ed Harris, can, uh, what's, this is my first time in Tulsa. And uh, so, so good. And also his partner, Glenda, is here with him. Also a very, very special guest is his mom, Ada, Graciela Duncan, and um, Ada is, came here especially for this from, from Oregon. And uh, one of the things that I really appreciate about her is that she epitomizes what the prize is about. The last statement there is what John Brock said. He uh, said, the best thing we do in life is educate our children. And so, Ada, I wanna thank you very much for taking that job seriously and you've done an outstanding job with your kids. I know, especially I know Jeff, and through your work with him, he's, you're impacting thousands of lives, and so thank you for that. <laughs> Dr. Jeff Duncan Andrade is Associate Professor of Raza Studies and Race and Resistance Studies at San Francisco State University. He is also founder of the Roses and Concrete Community School, a community responsive lab school in East Oakland, and the community responsive education group. Jeff's pedagogy has been widely studied around the world and acclaimed for producing uncommon levels of, levels of social and academic success for producing uncommon levels, uh, for producing uncommon levels of academic and social success. He's written numerous books and I will, I don't really even, to, in, in publications, I don't really need to say that to this audience. Many of you are here because you've read his work and want to be here. Not only have read his work, you've used it in your classes. And, and that says a lot, more than I can ever say, about what he does. Another thing that sort of, uh, I got a quote today from a 10-year-old uh, girl that probably uh, summarizes what Jeff is about more than anything I could say. Uh, at Ellen Ochoa Elementary School, they have what they call change makers. And they're a group of 10, 11 year olds. And one of the things they do to, as change makers is they have a podcast. And so today I was present and, and we, they, we were audience there to in privilege, we were privileged to, uh, for their interview of Jeff. And when it was over, I saw a little girl, Suri, uh, that was sort of smiling, and she was saying something but to herself, and I, and I just wanted to get that. I thought this might be a special moment. And so uh, I, said, I said, hi, what, what were you saying? She was a little bit shy at first, and she said, well, I just, I just want, this is just so wonderful. This, I'm, I'm a change maker, I wanna be a change maker, and this is the first time in my life I've really met someone who can really change the world. And so that's better than anything I could say for you, Jeff. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our laureate, Jeff Duncan Andrade. Good evening. That sounds about like my high school class. Let's try that again. <laughs> Good evening. That's a little better. So before um, I start, I just want to uh, re-acknowledge my family, um, particularly my mom. Um, first teacher, best teacher. And everything that I share with you today um, is just an extension of the teachings that um, she and my father gave me coming up. Um, and so I'm, 
humbly grateful to you, Mom, for um, all the things that you taught me and how you cared for me um, and how you taught me to, first to be a father to these boys um, and how that's an extension of the kind of teacher that I want to become. So thank you. Um, and then also to my partner, Glenda, for all the ways that you support me and have made all of this possible. Uh, Glenda, behind the scenes, was um, a huge uh, contributor to um, some of the materials that Brock asked for to, um, to talk about my work. Um, I'm not very good at talking about my work, so fortunately I have um, close friends and family that, that are. Um, and then to my sons, um, thank you for giving me new and deeper purpose um, just in the ways that you uh, have loved me and, and come into my life. And I love you boys very much. Thank you. Good job, son. <laughs> we forgot to rehearse that. <laughs> um, so I, before I start the talk, um, I just want to acknowledge uh, that we're on indigenous land. Um, and um, some of the traditions that um, my mother and some of my other um, elders have taught me um, is to be humble and that you don't just show up on somebody else's land and sh start sharing palabra because you uh, have three letters after your name or because some prestigious award invites you to do so, um, that when you come onto somebody else's land, um, you have to ask permission. And um, so I asked permission from the, the ancestors of this land um, and from the community whose land this actually is, despite what um, Oklahoma State University might think. Um, and then also um, from, from my own um, ancestors and elders, um, because I'm, I'm a believer in the seven generations principle, and I believe that everything that I'm sharing with you today um, is simply an echoing forward of seven generations of the best of my ancestors. Um, and <clears throat> the way that I've been taught the seven generations principle is that it, it, it cuts both ways. So everything that we do every day echoes forward seven generations. And that's how important each and every one of you is. Um, and every day that you contact young people, understand that this is not a generational impact, right? That this is, this is the legacy that you're leaving behind for many generations. Um, how we treat and talk to um, and respect our young people uh, isn't going away. Um, and so let's, let's hold and own that responsibility. The, the talk that I want to do today um, is, is a talk that, that I started doing um, a little while ago because I was asked from um, so many districts um, around the country to come and either be a thought partner or um, a co-author or a strategic partner because they were developing their uh, equity initiative. So equity's all the rage, y'all aware? This, yeah, so everybody's down for equity now. Um, and so I, I was reading, um, you know, all these um, proposals and, and, and uh, strategic plans and the frequency with which I saw these two words used interchangeably was stunning to me. Um, and so I started doing this talk to begin to disentangle this conversation about um, the difference between an equal education system, which by the way, we've never done, um, and an equitable education system. So um, these boys uh, are probably the single best insight I've ever had into the difference between equality and equity. Okay, so they are twins. Um, separated by seconds at birth, like it was a C-section, so it was like baby A, baby B. Um, who came out first, boys? Yeah, okay, so they know, trust me. Amaru lords it over Tayadi all the time, right? I'm older, dude, you're five seconds older. Yeah, I'm, I'm older. <laughs> so, um, by all rights and means, these boys are equal. I mean, literally seconds apart, right? Um, raised in this, they won't even sleep separately, right? I asked them, we have an extra room, and I'm like, do you want, no, we want the same room. So they are um, as, as equal as one might think two young people could be, right? And yet, hey, they could not be more different. So Amaru is constantly thirsty, okay? So much so that this dude will literally drop a straw into anything to try to extract liquid. And in this case, he jackpotted, he got himself a coconut. And Tayari is constantly hungry, 
Okay, so much so that this dude will literally store morsels of food on his shirt for later snacking. Okay. So in this context, is this equal? It's not a rhetorical question. It's a real question. Okay. So you're, you're, you're shaking your head, sister. Yep. And you say, immediately you went to the note. Why, why do you say that's not equal? Mm-hmm. But that's not what I asked you. I said, is it equal? Oh, excuse me, equal, not Ah, okay, so now you want to change your answer. You must be a teacher. <laughs> yep, I'm the same way. Because, <laughs> see, tell me your name. Crystal. Crystal. See, your problem, Crystal, <laughs> is that you don't start from here. You start from here and from here. And you start from here and here, when you work with young people, that's the wrong question. And what you did, Crystal, is you changed the question. You changed the question from the, is this equal to is this fair? And of course, then the answer is no. But there is nothing in the definition of equality that talks about fairness. And so the pursuit of an equal education system in a radically unequal society from jump in the only industrialized society in the history of the world to have committed two genocides, to have built its entire economy on slave labor, and still have the biggest wealth gap in the history of the industrialized world. And we're gonna go on and on and on into this data. And then talk about an equal education system is an absurd proposition. That before we can even have a conversation about equality, we have to confront the radicalized inequality that has nurtured and normed this society. Now, we started the conversation about an equal education system because we had legislated inequality in our education system. The Supreme Court of the United States ruled in Plessy versus Ferguson that separate was equal. Okay, so the Supreme Court had to re-legislate its own legislation in 1954 with the Brown decision to say separate is by definition unequal. So since 1954, the highest policy court in the land has established that racial segregation in public spaces, including schools, is illegal. Okay, that's 60 plus years. Does anybody know how much progress we've made on the racial desegregation of public schools since we made a commitment to equal education in 1954? Let's do some prices right, okay? Throw some bids out. How much? 5%, 10%, 20%, 80%, what do you think? Negative 20. You can't bid negative on the prices right. <laughs> but you're actually pretty close, okay? We, uh, there's a... Um, the UCLA Civil Rights Project run by Gary Orfield, who's a lawyer by training, but is one of the better educational historians we have in the country. Uh, they do um, a study on the, the progress uh, on the goal of Brown every 10 years. At the 60th anniversary of Brown, uh, their research revealed that city schools are more racially segregated now than they were before the Supreme Court said that's illegal. Okay. And that, y'all, is the value of a policy. We will not policy our way out of this. This does not mean that policy doesn't matter. Of course, policy matters. But a policy without attention to people on the ground that are going to have to actually implement and execute the policy is just pomp and circumstance. And that's mostly what we've had around our efforts at educational justice. Now, that doesn't mean hey, that an equal education system or unequal or unequal education system hasn't produced a bunch of results, and it has. And the data is crystal clear on how our education system is doing. Not long before Arne Duncan left office as the highest education official in the land in Barack Obama's administration, he was all over the national news lauding himself in the Obama administration for how much progress we had made under their leadership on high school graduation. Now, at the time, I was teaching high school English literature in Fremont High School in East Oakland, which is my neighborhood high school and arguably one of the 10 or 15 worst high schools in the United States. So I'm teaching high school English and I'm listening to the top ed official tell me we're doing better than ever. And I'm like, yo, this is some of the worst hey, educational environment that I've ever been a part of. And so 
he's all over the nation telling this story. I'm experiencing cognitive dissonance while actually in practice. And so I went and pulled this data. And so we reran the data. And this is the high school graduation map with only one control element inserted. Okay, all we did was control for income. So this is the high school graduation map for non-low income students. Does this shock anyone? Okay, probably not. Because most of the nation knows that middle and high income students get a pretty decent question mark given okay, all the things that we're seeing now in middle and high income high schools getting shot up all over the place. Okay. But in terms of outcome data, okay, most people know that they do pretty well. This is the map for low-income kids. This doesn't even code for race. And if that's not a national crisis, pray tell what is. Now, I know what y'all are thinking. Texas? Yeah. Yeah. Texas cheats. Yeah. Just look at the Secretary of Education under Bush and you'll find your answer. Okay. The New York Times, hey, just a few months ago, Okay, released even more damning data, okay, which suggests that even if young people okay, do well in school, when you code for race, okay, it does not transfer generationally. So they did a national study about the difference between white children and black children that go up rich. And then one generation later, where do they end up? Okay, and when they sorted that data, what they found is that 63% of white children maintain their wealth and privilege, okay, while 63% of black children lose it in one generation. So the idea that an access to a public education system and college is somehow gonna transform black life without actually addressing the elements of white supremacy that are still constantly impacting even middle-class and wealthy black people is not going to shift the paradigm. That should be okay, a core project of the public education project if our goal is to create a pluralistic multiracial democracy, question mark. Not sure that that's a goal. Okay. When we invert that, okay, it gets inverted. When black children grow up poor, hey, they're most likely to stay poor. When white children grow up poor, hey, they are twice as likely to enter into the middle and upper classes. This is not a public education system hey, that is creating hey, the great leveling playing field that was promised. And the list goes, how, how many of you all are data driven? Yeah, outstanding. I mean, I, I, look, I think it's important that we're data driven. Okay, now to get here from the hotel, because I'm, I'm, from, I'm from East Oakland, California. I'm not from Tulsa. Okay, so to get here from my hotel, hey, I had to use this. Okay, now my preferred navigation system is Waze. Okay? Glenda likes Google Maps, so whoever's driving gets to choose. Okay? But we use Waze, right? So to get to here from the hotel, what did I have to put into ways? An address, also known as data. Okay, now what would have happened if I put the wrong address in? And you, Ed would still be up here telling you stories about Ed Harris. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be somewhere else, okay, talking to some other people in Tulsa. But I'd still be data driven. It's not about being data driven. It's about being driven by the right data. And if you keep ending up in the same wrong place with the same group of kids, you're looking at the wrong data. Change the data you look at and change the questions you ask. You change the questions you ask, you change the answers you come up with. And if you end up in the same place again after changing the answers, what you know? Wrong data. Okay. Let's start changing the data we're looking at to evaluate the impact of our public school system in this pluralistic multiracial democracy. Here's some data for us. This is our national income data. We have the largest wealth income distribution gap in the history of the industrialized world. This is 
the corresponding incarceration data. We also have the highest per capita incarceration rate in the industrialized world. This is the global peace index. Like any index, it's imperfect, but it is considered the gold standard for international organizations that are measuring peace and democracy in societies around the world. It's used by UNESCO, it's used by the World Health Organization. In 2015, okay, uh, I started tracking this. And what's happening right now is what always happens when I show this slide, which is people have stopped looking at me and they've started looking for the U.S. in the rankings because the U.S. is obsessed with rankings. Well, we didn't make the top 15. In 2015, we were 94th. Now, if there's an index you want to score well on, especially when you're running around the world regulating peace and democracy, it's probably the Global Peace Index. Hey, well, we were 94th in 2015, hey, and it's just been getting worse. The 2018 index just got released, and we're now 121st. There are a few greater indictments of a national public education system than the creation of a wildly unpeaceful society. In 1854... London, England was near collapse. There was talk of shutting down the city completely because of a breakout of cholera that they couldn't contain. And as a last ditch effort to save the city, a group of medical doctors were sequestered by some of the leading officials in London. They locked them in a room. They said, you're not coming out of here until you get a solution for cholera. And so these doctors are all sitting around a table, knocking around all these ideas, and eventually one of them stands up and says, this is absurd. And they say, well, what do you mean? He says, well, every single solution we're coming up with defaults us to cholera. So we're not trying to figure out how to eradicate cholera. We're trying to figure out how to live with it. And they look back at him and said, yeah. And he said, I didn't sign up to be a medical doctor to live with sickness. I mean, I'm okay treating people when they're sick, but I signed it to be a medical doctor to create the conditions of wellness. And they looked back at this medical doctor and told him the same thing that I hear principals and teachers told all the time that are trying to radically rethink, not tinker around the edges, okay? not change from a one hour to a block schedule, okay? not call uh, PowerPoint slides educational innovation, but are really fundamentally rethinking the purpose. Why are we having children taken away from their families by law for 13 consecutive years for eight hours a day? Why are we doing that as a nation? And they said to him the same thing that I hear said to school leaders and teachers that ask that question, which is you're not being pragmatic. You're not looking at the data. And this medical doctor looked back at his colleagues, the top medical minds in London, and he said, if that what is, that's what it means to be part of your medical association, I don't want to be part of your medical association. And they say, cool. They showed him the door. That doctor's name is John Snow. No, not that John Snow. <laughs> that John Snow. And John Snow left the meeting of the top medical minds in all of London, and he hit the streets, and he became an ethnographer of the community that he served. One of the basic skills that I see in the most successful teachers I'm around is that they are first and foremost ethnographers of the community that they serve. So they make sure the curriculum, the pedagogy, the climate, and the culture is community responsive. It's responding to the material conditions of the lives of the children that are actually being paid to serve. John Snow began collecting data, and he interviewed as many people as he could that had cholera, and he interviewed as many people as he could that did not have cholera. And what John Snow found is a researcher's dream. He found causal, a perfect binary in his data. What John Snow found was that every single person in London that had cholera drank from that water fountain. And every single person that didn't didn't. So John Snow got a saw and he cut off the handle and cholera stopped. Stop 
drinking from the poison well of an equal education system in a radically unequal society. All of the data suggests that is not the path that we should be on. What the data suggests is that equity is the superior model, that an equitable education is the way you respond to historicized and present day radicalized inequality in a society. Because in a model of equity, if you're hungry, you get food. If you're thirsty, you get water. If you're hella thirsty, you get hella water. (laughs) In a model of equity, you get what you need when you need it. And the only way to create a classroom or a school environment that does that is by first asking children and families what they need instead of dictating to them what they need. Now, a number of scholars in fields outside of education, which I find are having much richer and much more accelerated conversations about this, are developing theories on how to do this. Angela Glover Blackwell calls it the curb cut effect. John Powell calls it targeted universalism, okay? You can, I think these are two great places to look for examples that we could deploy in education to create more equitable frameworks and approaches to meeting the needs of our kids, particularly our most wounded children. Or you could just go back to 1943 and pull up Maslow. And what we find in the research over the last four decades about the most effective teachers is that they tend to lean heavily into Maslow. And what we find in that research is that they tend to situate their practice with a focus in three domains, relationships, relevance, and responsibility, which uh, Alison Tintinango Kubales and myself have started uh, in the schools that we're working with around the country, started calling community responsiveness. That those are the three legs of the stool that create community responsive classrooms and schools. Now, I just want to acknowledge that um, Maslow, which Maslow acknowledged, and then it gets expunged from his later work. So in Maslow's early work, when he first starts talking about the hierarchy of needs, acknowledges that he didn't create the hierarchy of needs. He actually appropriated it from indigenous people. So Maslow came up with the hierarchy of needs while he was on the Blackfoot reservation. That is literally a picture of Maslow on the Blackfoot Res with Blackfoot people. And what he did was he adopted an indigenous practice called the breath of life. And he reattached it to where he believed we were as a society. So in indigenous communities, um, this uh, triangle is a teepee. And what you notice about the teepee is that it's open at the top, right? It's not fixed. So the problem with Maslow's framework is it's all about individualism. It's all about one child becoming self-actualized. And that's the pinnacle, right? From our indigenous perspective, hey, self-actualization is the starting point. And then the question is self-actualization for what? And for us, self-actualization finds its usefulness in an individual's ability to build and heal their community. Self-actualization becomes useful in a pluralistic multiracial democracy when that self-actualization is uplifting the community, not the individual's bank account. And community actualization for what? Okay, for us, the pinnacle is cultural perpetuity, the passing on of the best of our culture and our practices okay, onto the next generation of children and not repeating mistakes in school to the next generation. Okay? Because our schools are not about truth and reconciliation, we find ourselves in the situation we're in right now. Had schools been teaching about the African Holocaust and the indigenous Holocaust that happened in this country, we'd be a lot less likely to be having this conversation about what's going on with young black men and police. We'd be a lot less likely to have this conversation about what's going on alongside the border and this wall and all these people that we're trying to keep out. We'd be having a a much more profound conversation about our collective humanity. And it opens to the sky because it's not single generational. Right? It goes up, and when it go up, comes back down into the earth. Okay? What we pour into our children okay, is what we will grow next. Okay? So that model okay, that Maslow came up with, okay, 
he said, is a model of a sick nation. That as long as a nation is executing on this paradigm, okay, the Maslow hierarchy, we are sick. Because what that paradigm says is you actually have to say, you have to feed, clothe, or shelter children. We, that's why indigenous people don't say it, because duh. <laughs> That's not the starting point. Hey, if we have to say that, we in we are in trouble. Because we actually have to say it. What Maslow said is, we will be on the path hey, to a truly civilized and evolved society when this conversation is no longer needed because everybody's doing it. Hey? And he said, that's what indigenous people are on to. Hey? That we need to recommit to as a society because right now we're sick. That was 1943. And there is substantial research to suggest that indeed he is right and that the most successful teachers are doing this on a consistent basis and that's why they're so successful. Okay? So there's a lot of research to suggest that those three domains are the places we should be drilling and consistently drilling. I'll lift up a few okay? and I won't have a lot of time to go into depth with them just because this talk is aimed to be shorter. But um, with respect to relationships, right? I would start you off with Herb Cole, hey, who was uh, coined the phrase, wield not learning, to describe children that fail in schools, not as failures, right? But as children that are making conscious decisions to not learn from this system. And when he was interviewing one of those kids, uh, it, it produced probably the most famous quote from the book, okay? Because he looks back at Herb Cole and he says, Herb, I don't care what you know until I know that you care. And so recentering that as, and if you've taught a day, you know that's the truth, right? That you could have the dopest curriculum ever, right? The sweetest PowerPoint. If those children do not feel like you care about them, hey, you ain't gonna teach them shit, okay? Real talk. But if those kids believe that you care about them, you could have a whack lesson plan, right? And they'll work with you, right? <laughs> they'll let you know it's whack, right? But they're like, you could have a pass because I know that you really care about me. Hey, at the end of the day, hey, I've been at this gig 25 years. And at the end of the day, teaching and learning always, always, always boils down to one thing and one thing only, and that's relationships. And all the research concurs, whether we're talking about uh, a, a neuroscience lab at Stanford run by Robert Sapolsky, who wrote Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, or we're talking about psychology with Brene Brown hey, and all her right, TED Talks. We're crystal clear in the research community right, that we've got to move from sympathy to empathy. We've got to move from pobrecito, I feel sorry for you, to real empathic, authentically caring, as Angela Valenzuela says, cariño, hey? caring, deep, meaningful relationships with children if we're really going to get into deep, meaningful teaching and learning. When we get that right, hey, then the question is, well, what are we teaching these children? Now, I'm not big on checklists, but I'm going to give you one right now. If you want to create a culturally relevant, culturally sustaining, community responsive classroom, curriculum, school culture, then check yourself against this checklist. Does my curriculum, does my culture, does my pedagogy reflect students' lives, their communities, their families, and their ethnic, cultural, and linguistic histories? That's what it means to be relevant to a child. And all of the research supports this as well. We are crystal clear, cross-disciplinary about why relevance matters. And the reason hey, forms a pretty consistent pattern in student engagement and development. That when curriculum Pedagogy, climate and culture is authentically engaging to children as who they are, okay? then they're more likely to have knowledge of self. And that knowledge of self directly elevates self-esteem. And where did you just see self-esteem? 
Maslow. Where in Maslow? Okay, not the top. Yeah, it's the window into self-actualization. Okay? You are not self-actualizing if you have been taught to hate yourself. If you've been taught to hate the color of your hair, the texture of your hair, the color of your skin, the color of your eyes, the language you speak, the neighborhood you come from, your ancestors, okay? you don't have a shot to consistently self-actualize. And all of the neuroscience clearly reflects that. When we start building self-esteem, hey, that elevates young people's hope levels. Hey, hope is now the primary indicator being used in the medical field and in child psychology to identify children who successfully navigate toxic stress. And the children who are most likely to fall victim to those highly stressful and toxic moments in their lives are the children with the lowest hope levels. Hey, we know that hope directly interrupts stereotype threat. Okay? Folks familiar with Claude Steele's work in here? No? How many of you test children or a participant in a system that tests children? If you're a taxpayer, you're a participant in a system that tests children. Okay. Read Claude Steele's work. Read Whistling Vivaldi. Claude's a black psychologist at Stanford okay, who is one of the first psychologists to uncover why there are consistent okay, achievement disparities in standardized tests amongst kids of color and white children, even when you control for parent income, parent education, the number of words that they were read to when they were 2.5 years old. Okay? And what we know is, is that stereotypes actually affect your neural pathways. And when stereotypes are triggered, okay, you release chemicals in your brain that literally block your ability to access information. How many of you have taught students that can do the work and then they sit exam and they choke? We now know why. Okay? And it's called stereotype threat. Relevant material interrupts stereotype threat. Okay? And it creates what psychologists refer to as the Pygmalion effect. The Pygmalion effect is the self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay? So you can either read psychology or you can listen to Eminem because it's saying the same thing. Eminem says, I am whoever you say I am. Okay? Children are whoever their teacher says they are. And that is what results in what Carol Dweck calls a growth mindset. Okay? And if we want a growth mindset in children, we've got to cultivate a growth mindset in the adults that teach them. The, the mindset of children simply reflect back the mindset of the adult. And if you spend a day in high school, you know this to be true. Because you can have a kid who shows up in first period at 8 a.m. and they are brilliant, fully engaged, fully participatory, collaboratory, critical. Okay? And then the bell rings and they go to second period and suddenly they're a problem. Well, it can't be the kid. Okay? We've got to begin to create adult cultures of learning adult cultures of growth mindset. I end with the third leg of the stool, which is responsibility. And for me, in my mind, hey, we are most responsible as a nation for the children that most need our public schools, which means we are most responsible for the kids that we are doing the worst with. The most wounded child. And when you work with the most wounded child, you've got to understand woundedness. You've got to understand how it sits on the heart okay, and how it sits in the body and the brain. Of all the stuff I've read, Bruce Perry's The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog is the best starting point for people that are engaged daily with young people that are experiencing toxic stress. And what Bruce basically recommends in that book is Maslow, Maslow, Maslow triple down on Maslow. Because the first time you come, the child will probably reject it because they've learned not to trust. The second time you come, they'll reject it. Can you keep coming in the way that I have to keep coming with these boys? When they reject my care and my love, I don't say things like, well, fine then. I mean, I'm here to help you. And if you don't really want my support, then you just come back when you're really ready to learn. What kind of father would I be? Well, what kind of teacher would I be? Because we're saying that all the time to young people, this idea that some people aren't ready to learn. I'd like you to show me that child. I just, in 25 years, I never found one who isn't ready to learn. I found a whole bunch who ain't ready to learn the bullshit we're trying to teach them. But that's a different matter. Okay? 
We've got to start looking at our systems okay, because our systems okay, are reflected in the children that they produce. Now, just in case you think I'm up here theorizing, okay, I'm gonna actually give you a window into my classroom. And I'm gonna introduce you to a young person right, that is actually my neighbor who I taught for four years, so I literally teach my neighbor's children. Right? And um, she's gonna share a story with you that is a story that constantly sits on my heart and my head when I think about my responsibility as an educator. When I think about my responsibility as an educator, hey, this is the young person I think about. Because I know hey, that if I can create a classroom that is engaging for her, hey, that is meeting her where she is, hey, then I'm gonna get my arms around the overwhelming majority of the young people hey, that I'm charged with educating because she's the most wounded. Now, before we play this clip, I just want to acknowledge that some of you may be triggered by what she shares, okay? And if you are, please take the space that you need, okay? And if your colleague next to you gets triggered, please acknowledge their humanity and the fact that they're being triggered by what she says. So can we cue the video? How do we create classroom spaces, curriculum, pedagogy, relationships, where young people can bring that truth to bear as a core element of their educational experience and be held? You hear the students calling out to her, go ahead, we got you. You know why they're saying that? because they're next and they got similar stories. And so I'm gonna hold you because I'm gonna need you to hold me. How do we create classrooms where that level of truth telling can happen and no cheese may happens, no cyber bullying that doesn't hit the hallways, right? but young people are taught to hold each other's woundedness 
knowing that that holding of that woundedness is the key to the collective healing that our community needs. You wanna know how to stop the shooting? Love. Only way a young person picks up a gun and shoots somebody else that looks just like them is if they look in the mirror and they hate what they see. So many of our young people are going through school year after year. When, when, when does it first happen to her? When she's four, which means she went to kinder, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, my ninth grade class. She didn't let me have this till 10th grade. So she spent 10 years in school carrying that before school created a place where she could speak that truth in a way that she felt like she would be held and healed. When I think about our responsibility as educators, it's about that kid. And I guarantee you that kid is in your class. And all the data shows it. The national data on youth trauma shows that urban youth are twice as likely as soldiers returning from live combat to display the symptoms of mild to severe PTSD. That's the national data on youth trauma. One in three urban youth display the symptoms of mild to severe PTSD. And teachers get one trauma training a year. And like, okay, you're now trauma informed, right? Go fix the trauma. We've got to rethink what we're doing and why we're doing it. Now, I'll end okay, with the indigenous wisdom okay, that we've so often rejected that when we return to, so often provides answers. And the Cherokee, like many indigenous communities, have a story that they tell about a young boy who's out in his front yard and he's playing around in the front yard and he comes running into the house and he runs up to his abuelita and says, Abuelita! I feel like there's a war going on inside my head. And she says, there is, mijo. He says, who's fighting, abuelita? She says, the two wolves. He says, who are the two wolves, abuelita? She says, well, one wolf is rage, avarice, greed, selfishness, violence. He says, who's the other wolf, abuelita? She says, the other wolf is cariño. Familia, love, empathy. And he says, who wins, abuelita? And she says, the one you feed. Those wolves are alive in every single one of us. Every child we teach, that is not the question. That is the human condition, to be at war with ourselves. The question is when we will create educational paradigms right, that feed Cariño, familia, love, empathy, as rigor, as the things that we're actually measuring in schools. When will schools base their progress based on youth wellness and stop differentiating the wellness of our children from their academic scores? This is how we get the highest performing students in the nation directly responsible for the collapse of the housing and the banking industry. We can name them. Go and look for yourselves. They had the highest GPAs, the highest SAT scores, the highest grad school admission scores, hey, went to the most elite colleges and universities, but they lacked the moral compass. We've got to rethink the purpose of this project if we're gonna change the outcomes of this project. The point of public education is not to escape poverty. The point of public education is to end it. And if I can support you in any way on that journey, please do not hesitate to reach out. We are far from having it figured out. We struggle every day to try to put the pieces together, but we're trying to put a puzzle together that looks very different than the puzzle that we went through and the puzzle that I see a lot of people still trying to wrestle with. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Jeff. I'd like to invite the moderator and our panelists to come to the stage at this time to continue our conversation. Throughout the panel discussion, we'll accept questions from our live audience and our, and our virtual audience. Uh, to submit a question, as I said before, simply text or email us the following instructions at the bottom of the screen. And for those of you here, as I said before, on your seat, there should be cards for you to do that with those instructions. I'd like to introduce our panel participants. And um, good, I didn't. Sorry, got yeah. behind you. All right, I thought I was I was getting already. It's time for me to go. Um, Mr. Marco Herrera, it serves as the assistant principal of Ellen Choi Elementary. <laughs> a community school in East Tulsa. And previously, he served as a pre-K and kindergarten teacher at Tulsa Leg Legacy Charter School, and he, te and he is a Teach for America Greater Tulsa alumnus and is originally from La, La, Frontera, La Frontera, El Paso, Texas. Great job. Thank you. Mrs. Leach, Ms. Mrs. Lee's, man, I'm really messing this one, <laughs> everything up today. Okay. Uh, Ms. Lisa Witcher has served Union Public Schools for 17 years in a variety of administrative roles at the building and district levels, and currently as a senior executive director of instructional services uh, as that, in that position, she oversees professional learning, leadership development, early college, child, uh, early college high school, uh, college and career programming, and various other projects in the district. Jason Gillen, Gilly, oh. Mr. Jason Gilly currently serves as the building leader for Central, uh, Central Fine and Performing Arts located in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's a product of Tulsa Public Schools and returned to Tulsa in 2006, 2008, where he would serve students at KIPP Tulsa College Prep, McLean High School, and Central Fine and Performing Arts. And also we have, we are very delighted to have Ms. Fiza Walker. Fiza is currently a senior at McLean High School, taking courses at Tulsa Community College and a full-time big sister. Before attending McLean, she went to Ponca High School and Dove Science Academy. So we're very privileged to have Ms. Fiza Walker. Thank you. Also, our moderator tonight is Nate Morris, currently serves as manager of community organizing for the Met Cares Foundation here in Tulsa, working with community leaders to build collective power in the fight for equity throughout the city. So thank you very much, Nate. I'm gonna turn it over to Nate. Thank you. Oh, hello. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Duncan Andrade, for pushing us and challenging us tonight. Um, thank you all for being here, and panelists, thank you as well for what you do in our community um, and for coming to share your thoughts tonight. I want to start by giving you the opportunity a minute or two to share um, your reflections on what you've heard so far tonight. And Marco, we'll start with you and then go on down the line. Great. Um, is this, yeah. Um, so I think there are two fundamental, like sitting and listening, um, still trying to process all of that, right, is I think I have two fundamental takeaways, um, love and outcomes. And so uh, something Dr. Duncan Andrade said at the very end that I thought was really salient and really important to me is, is measuring um, and creating conditions within schools where we're measuring and, and uh, the, the ability of children to love each other and to work and collaborate amongst an, within a community to empower their community. And that's, that's, that's so important. And I think at the root of that is teachers that love children. I'm just an assistant principal. I'm just one guy who gets to go every, to work every day, hang out with the dopest children to ever walk the face of this earth. Um, I said at every school I've been at, with just three and they're all dope. So I think just kids in general are dope. Um, and so, 
when I just, I like, I'm always having these moments of just like, just sheer, just total inability to just even understand how incredible the work that teachers do every day when they, when, when you see it in action, when you see something like love, when you see a classroom like that where a teacher loves their students, you, one, you know it right away from the second you walk in, then I think two, you, um, you feel it and you're just, you're constantly blown away by that. And so going back to what he said about creating, you know, relationships, relevance and responsibility and, and creating love among students, I think about two teachers that are here and I'm going to really, this is, I'm going to be a little corny and be really uncomfortable and ask them to stand up. Ms. Whitehall and Ms. Yates, can you guys stand up for a quick second and can everybody give them a round of applause? Um, so I think, I think, again, I don't, I don't know anything, okay? I don't know anything, but I do know the, the work that these two women have done with a student in their classroom, Mr. Shaw, first grader, um, has, I've seen over the arc of a school year, a com this, this child that is engaged with his community, that is engaged with his friends, that loves himself, loves the people around him, and is a, is a not just a functioning member of our school community, but is a, is a, is, is a beautiful addition. He's an asset, and he never was, he never was not that. But he's giving him the skills to, to, to showcase the skills that he has by building relationships with him. I've seen them, do, I was like going through this checklist in my head as I was coming up. I was like, oh, they've done all three of those. Easy. He's like, we can talk. Hit me up after. I'll give you every single example that I have in my brain. Um, and to wrap my point up, the second thing, I think about outcomes. Um, I think about outcomes in that if, if, this, if we're in an in inherently inequitable society with an inherently inequitable education system, then the outcomes, the measures, the assessments, the things that we're testing for should just completely change and be completely different and not exist in the way that they are now. And I think that that's radical. That's, why, you know, that's something that w maybe we can't even foresee and conceive that, but I think that's where we need to go. And that, that is where I'm at in my current state of processing with all of that. That's a lot to think about, Marco. Um, <laughs> I'm still grappling with much that I read and all that I listened to, but um, at, at the risk of oversimplifying all of the topics that we talked about, as a third generation educator, I kind of come back to the book, All I Ever Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Um, to be kind, to be good, to think of others before you think of yourself, to share. Um, I think that those are overarching ideals that weren't necessarily named in today's talk or aren't necessarily named in the essays uh, that I've had the opportunity to read by Dr. Andrade, but I think they get to the core of what we're, what we're after for our kids um, and for the buildings that we wanna create where kids learn. We, we want them to have those ideals uh, that they learn and we want them when they look into our eyes and that we see we they see us looking into their eyes that they see that they matter um, the main thing that I got from it and I could relate to is the people who love you the people who will be your family extended family as that may be not by blood but by they love you they're the same people who are cheering me on the audience. They're not the people who are technically your family, but they're the people who choose you. And they are my teachers. They are my family, though. They love me and they support me. And the way they do that is through their love and showing me they love me every day I see them. And none of them are by blood, but they're the people who are here and they mean the most to me. And that's what I took. If you love unconditionally the way you love, you help children. You make hope for them by making them feel loved. She's on point, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, in my role, uh, a lot of times I have uh, various duties and responsibilities from a district. Um, and sometimes things get a little overwhelming. Things get a little cloudy. Uh, things get a little uh, uh, heavy at times. This right here is exactly why I got into education though. And it just kind of wraps it up for me. Um, I, I've never actually considered this. I guess I am a first generation uh, college graduate. Um, I serve at, as a principal at the same school my father dropped out of when he was in 11th grade. Um, so I, I do, um, I, I see a lot of these things. Um, I recognize a lot of these gaps that we have, uh, and I, 
I recognized him when I, while I was a student, like Fiza uh, as well. Uh, so I, I'm fortunate to be here. Some of the things that really stood out to me, um, so, uh, student belonging is something that I'm really striving for uh, at the high school right now. And we use, we use uh, tons of data, but driven by the right data. I'm not so sure. Uh, I'm having to self, you know, uh, you know, evaluate uh, if we are using the, the correct data at this point. Um, and also, if we're using the correct data cr to create the conditions of wellness or success for my young people. Um, not only that, something else that really jumped out to me that was said today was, uh, if you've been taught to hate yourself, there's no way for self-actualization. Uh, and this is no secret. If, you're, if you've been in Tulsa for more than a year, you know that uh, many of our young people, uh, many of our, our, our young people of color especially, have been taught to hate themselves, uh, even from adults. Uh, you can see it every day, even on social media, the way the news portrays them, uh, the way uh, the community looks at them, the way the community interacts with them. Uh, and uh, that's something that we definitely have to counter uh, in the school, in the public school, uh, public system. And that's something that I, 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 you know, it's the words right there. Was, I can write it down, take it back to, my, back to my administration team and say, hey, this is exactly what we need to focus on. This is exactly what we need to counter because I've never been able to really, I don't know, I haven't put that into words before. I've seen it, but I haven't put it into words before myself. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask a series of questions. Some are pre-prepared. Some are from you, the audience. Please keep sending those in, and we'll weave them together as we go through. Um, we've got about a little under 20 minutes remaining together, so I want to get to as many questions as we can, but also want this to feel like a conversation. So if a question wasn't directed toward you or you just want to jump in, Jeff, whenever, like, feel free to do that and engage in this, in this conversation. Um, but Fiza, since we're talking about students, we're talking about outcomes for students, right? I'm gonna start with you, right? Um, you and your peers are the reason why we're here. Um, and in, um, in his writing, Jeff has said that, I'll quote this, we know that nothing more profoundly undermines a community's hope than the outmigration of their best and brightest minds. When you instill hope in young people, they then become a generational hope for a community. So Fiza, as a senior at McLean, 4929, as a, uh, as a redesigned team member working to change what schools look like in Tulsa, how are our schools doing in giving your peers hope and what do we need to do better? One thing that I think that our schools do good of is maybe having people in there telling the students, like, it's like the simple question, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And when you grow up, sometimes things seem out of reach and out of, they, they aren't possible for someone like you. But when you see someone like you in the work, school working and you know they have a doctorate degree, you know they went to college, you know all these things about them, they inspire hope by just being in our school. And then on the opposite side of that being, how do we crush what they are and how like their hope, how do we do that? And it's by telling them you are only going to be confined to this school in this area. This is all you will ever amount to is your community. And they always make it seem like a bad thing. And the way we portray what is like the right thing you're supposed to do when you get out of high school and what's the wrong thing, but it should be whether or not you are doing what you love and want to pursue, and are you, are you happy? Are you safe? Those are the more important questions. Are you able to do the things you need to? Not, oh, you're, wait, you're gonna come back to the community and you're gonna stay, why aren't you leaving and going far away? Those shouldn't be the questions we ask. We should ask, oh, you're staying here. Is this something you love doing? And it comes back to like feeling belonged and knowing what your good is and what your right is, isn't by any means a definition to anyone. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, does anybody else want to add to that? 
Thank you, because I think that's a good, um, a good jumping point. Because when we talk about that, right, when we talk about how do we engage um, with kids, how do we build um, a system that, that teaches and trains our teachers to focus on relationships. I've gotten a ton of questions so far about curriculum and instruction. So um, Lisa, I'm going to come to you with that uh, as, an, as a leader in, in instruction um, for Union and in Tulsa in general. Um, this question we've talked about, Jeff mentioned, fundamentally rethinking the purpose of education. Um, and how do we build a pedagogy uh, that, is, that is rooted in compassion and love? And I think that requires a sort of upending what the traditional role of a teacher looks like. And so to you, what is, how do we do that from an instructional level, from a district level, and training and teaching our teachers? I think there's... There's two parts to that answer. One is always going to be the individual response or the individual responsibility um, for instruction and meeting the student in front of you where he or she is. Um, and then there's this systemic responsibility or response. Um, and so I'll, I'll go back to my first answer. Every child has to be seen. It is important that as a teacher or administrator or counselor, that when a student walks in the door, they see my eyes seeing their eyes. I see you. That they have to be seen. And there are too many of our, our, our youth that go unseen for lots of nameable and unnameable, unnameable reasons. Um, some of it is fear. Some of it is complacency. Some of it is prejudice. Um, but we have to look at them and we have to see them so that they know that they matter. That's our individual responsibilities, regardless our school size, regardless our demographic makeup, our, our children have to be seen. And then I think the systemic response um, uh, is, is twofold. And like Marco, we, I agree, we need to blow the, the sides off the box on this thing. Um, there is a, a quote on a TV show that says, education is a silver bullet. Education is everything. Competition for the best teachers should be fierce. They should be paid a six-figure salary. Um, our buildings should be cathedrals. They should be challenging. Uh, they should be palaces. And choice, my part of the quote would be that choice, healthy choices, all the things that can make them be whoever they want to be and however they see themselves serving the community should be a part of that pedagogy. Uh, um, but we can't have any of that if we don't have individuals who know that the individuals walking through the door are the most important part of this puzzle. Thank you. Um. And Jason, you said earlier, and I think this hits on a question, um, that many of your, our young people of color in Tulsa have been taught um, to hate themselves. Um, and that, uh, I think, just resonates with all of us when we hear that. Um, and it, it is deeply painful, but it's also very true, right? We live um, in a city and in a, in a society, and Jeff, you were naming this, um, where the roots of our system, including our education system, um, find themselves in a history of, of racism, of white supremacy, of colonialism. And you said in, um, in one of your earlier articles, Jeff, that the best teachers are the ones who are conscious of that and who stand in opposition to it every day. Um, so my question is, even though some people may hear that and dismiss it, my question is, in order for us to be conscious about combating those systems of oppression, combating racism and white supremacy within the system of education, um, what, um, what does it mean to stand in opposition to that? And can we name what those things look like within our schools today? Um, and I want to toss that first to the school leaders on stage. So Jason and Marco. Okay. Um. Well, I think um, first and foremost, um, I think that the adults in the building have to acknowledge within themselves uh, that they have biases or that they have uh, been uh, programmed to uh, think certain things about certain people uh, because we see it all the time uh, and our young people see it. Our young people definitely see it. Uh, and it, it comes to a point um, to where if they don't feel as if they're seen, if they don't feel that you, that you care, then just, just, like, just like Jeff said, it doesn't matter how great the lesson is, it doesn't matter what you bring to them, 
They're not trying to cure it. So it comes to a point where we have to acknowledge the things within ourselves. Uh, and as, as, as my role, uh, what I do is um, that's through observations, that that's through just, you know, in, in the classrooms, talking to young people, because they give me, they'll tell me how they feel uh, as well, is having those uncomfortable conversations with the adult as well. Uh, because at the end of the day, even all of our educators, we're lifelong learners. So we just have to continue to learn about ourselves. We have to continue to learn how to reach young people. We have to continue to learn uh, where we fall, where we have our, uh, you know, our gaps. Uh, so it, it's really having some uncomfortable conversations and trying to address some of our, uh, our biases, some of our weaker areas. Uh, what I have to work on, and this is me, I, I, have, a, I have a ton of patience with, uh, with young people. Um, I have a ton of patience with young people. Where I lack in is I don't have a lot of patience with adults, but at the same time, they're still learners as, as well. Uh, and so I know, and this is, you know, this is my third year as principal, so I'm, I'm, still, I'm, I'm still wet behind the ears. I'm still learning things every day. Uh, but for me to take the time to work with uh, adults who I, I feel like should already know, but sometimes they don't necessarily have uh, the self-actualization -actual themselves. Uh, and so if they don't have it, how am I supposed to expect for them to instill that in young people? Uh, so it's really trying to, um, knowing my teachers, knowing my, you know, the adults in front of the young people, uh, and being able to work with them through their, um, through their own biases and through their own, uh, their own gaps. Cool. Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> similarly a lot of what Jason shared, um, about the first part is having the conversation with adults in the room. There's an in how inherent power that adults hold within a school building. Um, and it's structured in that way. So I think addressing the biases and, and mindsets that exist within adults is, is, a, is a crucial first step. Um, I also think it's about honoring the context and honoring the community and honoring the fact that in, within the white supremacist colonialist society that we exist in, communities of color that, that we work in, those communities haven't, as in general, haven't been granted their own dignity and humanity. We, we judge uh, the way that parents are parenting. We judge the way people live their lifestyles. We judge, you know, we dictate, this is what you need. I dictate this need based on what I feel is important and what I think is valuable. You are lacking in that, so I'm gonna give you this, but there's no conversation. So valuing the dignity and the humanity of the, of the community on a, on a structural level and saying, I want, to, I want the community members, community should be a part of every single thing that we do at schools. Every single decision that we make, they should be a part of. We want to dismantle colonialism. Colonialism is big on power. I got the power. I'm the assistant principal. I'm the guy that sits in the front office. How am I going to dismantle that? I'm complicit in it right now because that's the way it's structured. So let's dismantle that, but let's bring the community in. Let's honor the, in, the, the sanctity of, let's honor the sanctity of the children that are in the building. Maybe, you know, everything we do with kids is perfect and works well. We did a podcast with Dr. Duncan Andrade today. I, we didn't write a single word of the script. We didn't, I didn't dictate what they were supposed to talk about, and they blew it out of the water. We have after-school programming. Our last session at the end of every year is run by the students. It's always like this resounding success, and where are my feelings? I'm in my office by myself crying because I'm so excited about these things that are in Everything is a resounding success, so let's, let's enable children to be, to be community enablers to build within that and to learn those skills on the job. Like We want to create community actualization. We can create that within our schools where kids are learning those skills that are necessary. Um, and, and so I think just honoring that dignity and, and the humanity and saying, you have this power, I'm complicit in it, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to intentionally remove power from myself and grant it back to you. Because I, I, for whatever reason, someone said that this guy has access to the resources. Chef, is there anything you want to add to what we've said so far? I think what's coming from me in a lot of these comments is um, and really where my thinking is at, um, because we, we, we really try to do that at, at Roses and Concrete, and we have really struggled with it, right? It's, I mean, like everything works on the whiteboard, right? But uh, on the ground, I, it's messy, right? Um, and, but I think that it's a, it's, a, it's a worthy and worthwhile endeavor that will put us into these deeply uncomfortable places and that's where power gets uncomfortable, right? Because when you have power, 
part of having power means you get to pick and choose when you're comfortable and when you're too uncomfortable, right? And when you don't got power, you never get to choose that, right? So I think that there's gonna have to be a lot of learning around what that, the application of that theory, right? Redistributed leadership, shared governance, like these are words that are coming up a lot in at Roses and Concrete um, that I think we, we really don't know what those mean yet in, in a school environment because there just aren't very many good models, right? And so we, you know, it's the field of dreams model. If you build it, they will come, right? But, so we got to get to building. Stop tinkering and get to building. And the other thing that's really sitting in my head right now is, is this. So h- how many of you own a home? Show of hand. Okay, that's how I know I'm in Tulsa and not California. <laughs> Educators that own homes. Wow, that's deep. Okay, so, um, so any of you that own a home, uh, when you first bought the home, what was the first thing that you had inspected? So, so somebody said the foundation. Who said that? Okay, several of you. That's good. That means you made a good decision. Hey, so wh- wh- when, you, when, you, when you had, why did you have the foundation inspected? I mean, why do you have the HVAC system or the, the, the new roof or the, you know, state-of-the-art uh, kitchen or wh- why, why the foundation? Oh, wow. All right. So what do you mean? Right. Right. So have we really looked at the foundation of public schools? Because the foundation of public schools is rotten, particularly for working people, poor people, right? But the public sensibility and narrative is, that, is, is the, the old Horace Mann okie doke, right? Which is this is going to be the great equalizer. But if you actually study Horace Mann, read Joel Spring, okay, American Education. If you really study um, the, the, the origins of public schools, you find that the, you're no longer confused about why what's happening in public schools is happening, right? So if we are, you wouldn't do that in your house, but we keep doing it in schools. We keep putting lipstick on the pig. It's still a pig, okay? So what we, we got to do, right, is to get foundational, Right? And that's the purpose trip for what? Okay? Because schools are doing exactly what they're designed to do. So can we please stop saying that schools are failing? Because my mom is 90 years old. And one of the things that she ta- ha- continues to teach me is that if you're doing what you're supposed to do, you ain't failing. Right? So schools serving poor children and children of color are not failing. They are doing exactly what they're designed to do. And if we start there, then, right, the work changes. Because then we stop tinkering with stuff. And we start saying, actually, what we need to do is buy dynamite, right, and rebuild, okay? And that's, right, that's the work of truth and reconciliation. Telling the truth about what we've done is the only way that we change what we're doing. But we're loathed. We're death dodging, death ducking, death denying, as Cornel West says, right? We duck it all the time. And kids know it. They know you're lying to me. You are lying to me. Right? Read James Lowen's Lies My Teacher Told Me. Right? We do it all the time, and we know it. And until we're willing to really confront that, then kids are going to have a hard time really deeply, authentically investing in school, particularly the most marginalized and wounded youth because they're living out our lies. And, and so, yes, I'm with you on, like, I want kindness, right? But I'm also recognizing that I work with so many young people who, you want me to be kind? Come to my hood and tell me to be kind. Police, shoot me. People that are paid by the state to carry guns and protect and serve, execute my people. And until we're willing to deal with that, don't ask me to be kind. Okay? Now, yes, I want my sons to be kind. Right? But to me, part of kindness is telling hard truths. 
right? And I don't think that's what we mean when we talk about young people being kind, right? And, and so I want to combine those two ideas, right? That kindness is an authenticity that I don't think that we've achieved yet in schools. And I believe, fundamentally believe that, and I believe this to my core, y'all, we could flip this in one generation. In one gener- if one generation of children goes through school and at every single, this is what I was telling your young people today, if at every single edge of that school, they experience that any form of inequality is odious. So no oppression Olympics. We can't deal with white supremacy and ignore male supremacy. We can't deal with male supremacy and ignore class supremacy. We can't deal with class supremacy and ignore hetero supremacy. All forms of inequality on the table all the time, any form of inequality, odious. Imagine a society where young people go through a public school system where that is all they know. I don't care what's happening at home. I don't care what's happening on the block. I don't care what's happening on TV, right? Schools are the single biggest influence on young people's lives. No one has them more, including the parents. We have them the longest. If that's all they knew in school for 13 years, what kind of adults would we have? We'd have adults that were intolerant of injustice. Right? And so for me, let's start there foundationally. How do we build a curriculum? How do we build pedagogy? How do we train teachers? How do we assess right, that that's what our schools are actually accomplishing? And then I think we got a fighting chance to start eradicating some of, the, some of this stuff right, and really create a transformation in this society. They're the key. Right? We all know it, but we don't seem to change the way in which we work with them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, there are a ton of incredible questions, and I know that we could all probably sit here and have this conversation for a lot longer, but unfortunately, we do have to close it up. So um, thank you again to our incredible panel and to Jeff for your time tonight. And Ed, you're going to come up and close us out. Great. Yes, I, I agree. Um, one of the things about the Brock Prize is that to, bring, to get these ideas in the open, and we're certainly not going to solve the problem uh, in this hour and a half, but hopefully in Tulsa and the, those people that came, those of you that came here today, this hopefully is a beginning of a very intentional, critical conversation that we have, and a truthful conversation. And you may uh, may not agree 100%, but that's also part of being a community, is talking through things, getting things in the open, uh, working through things. And I think as uh, educators in Tulsa, uh, that's our, in Oklahoma, that is our task. And hopefully this is the first of many, many conversations like this that we have. And I agree with Jeff, in one generation, we could turn things around. So again, Jeff, I really thank you for being here today. I'd like to give Jeff one more round of applause. Just keep standing, keep standing, because I want to give the committee another round of applause, too. So just stand up. And thank you. I'll say a few closing, very few closing words, and we can go. But uh, there's a feedback card, and we'd love to have your comments on this. Uh, We really take those in, in consideration. We look at all of them. We do keep record, or we keep data on on this, (laughs) and so we're data-driven in that way. Um, And I'd like to recognize several individuals who really contributed to this planning and development of this year's uh, Brock Symposium. One is uh, Dr. Pam Fry, again, executive committee member and also provost here at OSU Tulsa, and she really did a lot in helping us prepare, just paved the way for us to do this. Uh, I'd like also to thank uh, Dr. Chris Ormsby, who oversees ITLE at Oklahoma State. And we have a world-class OK State TV uh, media specialist. And uh, 
and they are, they are the prime people, and I really thank you so much for, for what you've done. Uh, we also had a planning team here, uh, Anissa West, Andrea Castaneda, Greg Robinson, Tim Newton, Sandy, Sandy Calvin, and Rita Long. Thank you very much for planning this. It was, yes. And my team, uh, Kate Schwark, Jessica Noonan, and Cindy Schaefer, we really thank you for all you've done. Again, thank you very much for coming. And remember, the most important thing we do is educate our children and drive carefully. And as always, go Cowboys, go Hurricane, and go Sooners. Go get them. <laughs>